Welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast today with Quincy Johnson. Welcome, Quincy. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. No, thanks for waiting through technical difficulties we've had the past couple of days, but we actually got this guy going this time. So just for people who aren't familiar, and even for myself, Quincy, do you want to maybe give a brief background about yourself and what you're up to? Well, sure. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having me on again. I, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, currently I am a uh, assistant professor at the University of Kansas Department of Health, Sport, Exercise Sciences. I instruct our undergrad, graduate level, strength, condition, and sports science courses. Um, aside from that, I'm assistant director in the Jayhawk Athletic Performance Lab, um, which is a member of the WUSA Human Performance Alliance. So that's another hat that I wear. And then outside of that, I work with athletes. Um, I've been a strength conditioning coach for nearly the last decade. So um, played sports growing up, started football at five, started resistance training at 12 years old. My dad got me hooked up with an official Damn. certified lucky. coach. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> I know it. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a shorter guy, so I needed every tool. I needed every advantage that I could get. So, um, yeah, my dad really was ahead of the curve there. And, yeah, ever since then, I haven't looked back. So I've always been almost 20 years now being around a weight room. So, so yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, aside from that, um, MMA, the last year or so, last year or two, um, has become a pretty big interest of mine, especially the strength condition component. So looking forward to awesome. it. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that as well. I, I was actually looking uh, up some of your stuff. I think on Google Scholar, you've, have you published a lot of research in first responders? Is that you that I found? Yeah, that's me. That's okay. me. Tactical, okay. tactical research. Yes. Nice. That's that's interesting. I saw you had stuff on firefighters, SWAT, uh, SWAT teams, and all sorts of stuff going on there. Is that like a interest, uh, like a interest project for you, or something that you're passionate about, or is that something you kind of fell into? Uh, something I kind of fell into. So um, during my PhD at Oklahoma State University, um, one of my PhD committee members was Dr. Jay Dawes. So his background, for anybody that knows Dr. Dawes, is pretty much solely tactical at this point now. So fire, police, EMT, um, not only military, but also ROTC, special ops. Um, so different levels, different career fields. Um, but also, I've served as strength conditioning coordinator for OSU Police Department for two years. Oh, wow. so I thought it was interesting, obviously, to have that applied experience, but also to have that research lab based experience. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, that's me. <laughs> is, there, is there much uh, you've taken from that tactical area into some any of your MMA strength and conditioning? Um, yes and no, and probably not the things most people would think. Right? They probably think it's you know. What'd you learn mindset wise? How do the best percent <laughs> yeah. like literally? No, um, it's like just the basic <laughs> things like building relationships, right? Asking the right questions, learning how to craft your program and design and periodize, right? Um, the right exercises at the right times, right? To get the right adaptation that you want. Um, learning like timing, right? Of the exercise of the training session. Um, if you do it after, they're probably going to be cooked depending on the schedule that they had. Um, if you do it before, right, just expect these things. So I would say more so on the organizational side, yes, there are some elite mindsets there. Um, but yeah, aside from that, um, really just how to structure, how to treat people, talk to them, build relationships, create buy-in early. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Nice. Nice. So regarding your, your MMA strength condition, obviously you, you have kind of gone down this path and I think a lot of strength conditioning coaches kind of come in as a, I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say a passion project, but it's something they're passionate about. Um, especially since uh, I think we, as we both know, strength and conditioning typically in combat sports is well behind the times a lot of the time uh, with a lot of the stuff going on. So it becomes, I guess, an educational thing for us too. So it'll be interesting just to quickly a very broad general question, just kind of like your philosophy around MMA strength and conditioning. You know, what is that summed up, and then have you drawn any influences from you know, other areas of strength and conditioning? Um, I would say my philosophy is uh, the best ability is availability, number one. Number two, fighters fight. Um, number three, athletes are not weightlifters. So at any given time, right, that flips around. But um, for the most part, my priority is to make sure that my athletes are, number one, they're available for training, right? Strength and conditioning is a supplement to the sport. So sure, in the off season, maybe it takes more of that center stage, but it's never really truly 
the priority, right? Fighters need to fight. Um, and then also understanding, again, it's just a supplement. So we want them to be great in the cage, on the mats, right? So if they can't do the most advanced, you know, technical lift, that's fine. Um, we just need to find something to develop the exact quality that we're after. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but that's, that's kind of my, yeah, before when I just started off in the field and sometimes for different populations, I had a very well written, you know, by the book philosophy and, um, this is my vision. These are my values and this is exactly what I hope to implement. And this, I want to uplift, encourage, inspire, but for MMA, not that they don't need it, but just to get straight to the point. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have very similar philosophies based on the, the things you said there. So there won't be too much arguing with <laughs> different viewpoints, <laughs> unfortunately. But we're, we're going to dive down this road anyway. And we can get into some specifics too. Um, just around, I guess, how, how training changes, you know, throughout a training year. Because I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of listeners may get kind of stuck in how they plan their training. I, mean, I get a lot of questions through Instagram as well on different things that people will find Instagram clips of people talking about different things and kind of get a little confused about, you know, I said this thing and this person said this thing. It'll be good to kind of dive into a few things over a training year because I think people like to see almost like black and white, like, okay, this is good and this is bad. But obviously, it kind of depends on where you are within your training. So should we maybe just start, let's just say, how training generally looks, we'll call it out of camp, so away from a fight, and then how that changes maybe as you're getting closer towards a fight. And we can just start with just the strength training if that's easier, then maybe move into the conditioning after that, just or we can blend it together, whichever is easiest to kind of get. Sure, yeah, that, that sounds good to me, maybe. Um, well, I guess for me, I just I take an integrated approach. I guess that's the sophisticated. But I, so the way that I got into um, strength conditioning for MMA athletes was completely by accident, fell into it, um, met the nicest lady at the university that I worked at. Her name was Karen Primer. Her son was a fighter at a local gym and I had like a CSCS plaque on the wall or something. She's like, Hey, what's that? And so, you know, it's just one of those storybook moments, right? Who would have thought? <laughs> um, and so after being introduced to the coach and the coaches and kind of hearing what they were after, what their goals were, what they thought would get them to the next level. Um, I was able to, kind of proposed just a training program, just lay it out for a full year. This is what it would look like. Um, and it's really simple, really straightforward. And so from there, like in our off camp, um, it's pretty much for us about 80% general, or it was at that time. Really, really general compound lifts, right? And we're trying to build up, number one, we're just trying to make sure that everybody's healthy, right? Coming off of maybe they had a three fight um, competitive phase, or maybe they had four fights, or maybe they did uh, multiple disciplines. And so they had a couple jujitsu tournaments. And this is true. It happened with us, jujitsu, boxing, and then cage fighting. Like, <laughs> dang that you guys have, you guys have been, yeah, you've been put through it. So that off camp for us. Yeah. For me, it was like jumping right in. And little background of the sport, how can I make it as simple as possible? Off campus, primarily compound movements, um, multi-joint movements, very, very general. We're going to squat. We're going to push. We're going to hinge. We're going to lunge. We're going to step. Um, we're going to do some core, some core movements, and we're going to do those things well. To layer that with conditioning, we're just, we're just like lightly developing um, the energy systems, each energy system, ATP, PCR, glycolysis and then um, our oxidative system so um i'll probably pause there <laughs> <laughs> you're good that's, that's really good so uh, on on the strength training side then in terms of you obviously talked about it's more general and i'm assuming then that means you're going to say that as you get closer to fight it becomes more specific if not correct me if i'm wrong but what what does general specific mean to you within these two phases so i guess for me the best way to put it is if you walked in on one of our training sessions one morning and we're in the off camp phase, a lot of the movements we're doing exercises look nothing like fighting. They look like it doesn't look like you're a bodybuilder or a power lifter either, but it doesn't resemble 
fighting. Um, any of the movements, ranges of motion, sometimes even the speeds, they're, they're general. We're just taking our time. We're building strength. We're taking rest between sets. Now, if you show up in a couple months and we have, we're eight weeks out from a fight or six weeks out from a fight, it's like, holy crap, these guys have resistance bands. These guys have kettlebells. Um, they're sprinting in place or they're on that bike and they're hitting 10 second all out bursts, 12 second all out bursts or something similar, or they got dumbbells and they're throwing their punches. Um, so yeah, the further away, the more general it is, the closer to the more specific, it looks like a fight. Do, do you, do you still layer in some of that general work just for say, for example, if you want maximal strength or power development in that phase, and then you're still layering on some of these more, I guess, specific exercises on top of those. It, it really depends. Um, for our group, they weren't, I wouldn't say they were, you know, very young. So they're, they're around late twenties, early thirties. So I was like, okay, do they need a break from some of that specific work? But I would, I'm, I'm happy to always, we'll do some light plow metrics. Uh, we'll do some net ball slams if they want their rotational or throws, if they want their rotational aspect. Yeah, definitely. Nice, nice. And you, you mentioned as well the energy system training. Uh, through the, the off camp, you're kind of touchy on all three there. Do you maybe give some examples of what a, a session would look like where you're trying to target some of these energy systems or, or whatever, or the adaptations you're trying to elicit from them? Yeah, so I was telling someone, I was showing them like the first training block that we ran. I know um, Coach Richard, he kind of like raised his eyebrows like, this is it, because they were coming off of doing, I think they were doing 90 second efforts on the bike, right? Just all out effort. And they were maybe taking 30 seconds to 60 seconds break in between. But um, something that I noticed is that it was just out of sync. Their training was right. So they're, that's a pretty big effort, right? 90 second all out effort, 30, 60 second recovery. That's, that takes <laughs> a robust energy system. And they're doing this like far away from competition because just because they can, you know, it's like, okay. Um, so, an example was we would do um, six second all out burst, but we would only do three to five and then we would take rest in between, um, like a minute rest. And then we do again. So in a session and the conditioning session, just on the bike. And that's another thing maybe we talk about is conditioning and kind of what's worked for me, what worked well, my preference, but we would do maybe three sets of five, six second burst, and then we would rest 12. 18 seconds and they all looked like in the beginning like this is it but we eventually progressed up to like 15 second burst repeats 20 second burst repeats um and a lot of them have credited that condition and to being able to go deep into those rounds um but for conditioning for whenever i had time with athletes we didn't do a ton of like mile we didn't get a lot of miles in on the road they were just just get so beat up that the sport the name of the game is to show up, be able to train, to be your best, to stack those days, and then progress technically. Um, so I felt, why not utilize the bikes? We had like four or five bikes just sitting right up in the front room. So why not take a little bit of load off of the tendons and ligaments, and let's just develop the respiratory system. I like it. <laughs> What's the... Uh... With the, do you want to maybe run through some of that progression there? Obviously, you mentioned they're doing five-second sprints with, what was it, 18 to 20 seconds rest, times five, rest a minute, repeat again for another set. Do you want to go from there and kind of let the listeners know how that kind of progressed eventually to those 20-second bursts and what that final, I guess, those final sessions kind of look like? Yeah, so we essentially, like, flipped that work-to-rest ratio. So it was like a, it was like a one-to-three work-to-rest in the beginning, like six-second burst, 18-second rest, one-to-three, pretty simple, like – most, if you've been showing up to the gym, if you've been turning up, you should be able to handle that, you know, um, and, and they did. And so my big thing was I didn't want to burn the cake, right? I didn't want to come in. That's not where I was. Like, my big thing is I want to create champions. And we did. Like, three out of the four athletes went on to win belts. So, like, I'm not here. I put the ego aside. Sure, I had the credentials. Sure, I had the education. But that's not what I'm here to do. So, so that was the thing. Like, make the entry point super easy, right? Everybody gets in. Everybody can hang for the first few weeks. So, um, we went one to three. So, like, six to 18 was the work to rest. And then we went six to 12, right? And then we start getting into like the six to six. And once they can start to handle that repeats and we do five repeats, I know it may not be by the book, but I just think for 
um, MMA, you either have three rounds or five rounds. Typically, you, re- you either have three minutes or five minutes. So whenever we're doing sets, typically that's easiest to understand. So, so once we're hitting six on six, then we start pushing that threshold back a little bit. Um, so I might even skip like 10 seconds and go right to 12 seconds to where we go 12, 24. So now we're just doing a one to two and then we go 12, 12 and then we go 12, six. So we start to flip that ratio. Yeah. Yeah. And so it doesn't take long. Right. Um, <laughs> so that's just like one way that's the ATP PCR system development. And of course you might um, just through the demand of that um, develop your glycolysis system. Right. Um, so if we're working in that intermediate zone, I, I know the recommendation is like 30 seconds. Like that's supposed to be the sweet spot, but I always start a little bit under just to allow for a little room. You never know. Maybe they had a tough session the day before. Maybe they have a tough one coming up. Maybe they didn't sleep. So I try to account for that because ultimately I want them to get the output. That's what I'm after. And I want them to show up and have positive, great outputs each day. So um, right there in that zone, we'll probably start truly at like 15 second burst. Um, probably three 15 second bursts is what we did. Um, and then rest minute, maybe two minutes. I only choose a minute because you get a minute between rounds. So I try to make it, some things are going to stay consistent. So even though we're lifting weights, I still want it in your mind. The reason why we're doing this is a transfer to the cage. I hope you're enjoying the chat so far. Before we get back to that, I just want to let you know that Sweet Science of Fighting is more than just a podcast. We have a full training app with strength conditioning programs for strikers, grapplers, and MMA athletes. So you don't have to think about what you're doing and you're getting access to the latest scientific methods to improve combat sports performance. We have programs specifically for judo, for jujitsu, for wrestling, MMA, boxing, Muay Thai is coming soon. All these things are going to be in the training app. We also have a private community where some of the coaches that have been on the podcast are in there to help you with any training questions and any performance questions you have. For example, Andrew Usher and Casper DeVitt. We also have some online courses within the training app. They cover strength, conditioning, mental skills, and weight cutting. And finally, we now have Ryan Villalobos in the community, a second degree jiu-jitsu black belt, who is there to break down any of your grappling matches that you want seen to by a second eye. He's currently breaking down videos on a separate Sweet Science of Fighting YouTube channel, and he will break down your video within the community. So if you have a match or a role that you just recorded, you can upload that in there and Ryan will break that down for you. So what are you waiting for? Jump down in the description. You can check out the Sweet Science of Fighting underground. Otherwise, enjoy the podcast. And and then the oxidative stuff you mentioned, obviously, you they, they weren't running and that's a contentious or it's a contentious argument in combat sports. So what were you doing in that? Was it just lift stuff or were you doing some, for example, steady state cardio stuff on the bike? Steady state. Um, we started them off at like 55 RPM um, just on the bike. So, um, and we never really went above 65 RPM because really the goal, yes, we're conditioning, but, you're, they're doing so much on the mat. Like for me, it was eye opening. I went and trained for a week, like one of the athletes, you know, I was like, okay, I have a new respect. So it made me dial back. And even in my mind, I was going in pretty conservative, but I had some ideas like, yeah, on this week. Yeah. We're going to show them who's boss. We're going to really lay it on them. And then I got into those sessions like, okay, so this is what one feels like. And they're doing multiple. Okay. Um, so those are really just more, more so recovery, aerobic recovery sessions, pretty low intensity, I would say steady state. Yeah. Where, where would you place this condition typically within a week? And then, uh, how many times a week were you, were you doing some of these sessions? So in our off season, further away from the fight, we'll do more. So typically three from what we've seen, obviously what the literature suggests, three sessions per week seem to be about the sweet spot without overdoing it. Um, you can develop the muscular, the muscles that you want, tendons, ligaments, um, also the cardiovascular system. Um, you should be able to, if you have a well-coordinated design program, um, we would do it like Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, um, Monday to start the week off, just get them in. Let's get them in the flow of training. Yep. Um, and then, 
as you get closer to or into fight camps, we start to dial back from three sessions to two sessions to maybe one session as they start to go through that weight cut, depending on how much weight they have to cut. Gotcha. And we we talked a little bit about the the specificity of of the stuff you're doing in the gym. Is there a point you think that you can get too specific with what's going on and it's almost better to just be doing the actual sport itself? Or how, how close are you drawing that line with what you're choosing exercise wise in the gym? Um that's a good question. I like to give them I like to give the fighters tools. So I don't want it like if if I want them to put on gloves, hit a bag or hit somebody, like we would just do that instead so sure um it's really just getting down to that gross motor pattern or it's really getting down to that physical quality that we're hoping to develop um so even if it's punching um it's not just punching it's with dumbbells or you have a band right um so that's i try to keep them separate because it's strength conditioning resistance training but um yeah as far as for my conditioning we don't really strike pads a ton um we don't. So I like to keep it separate, but I know others. It's a philosophy thing. Um, the big thing, big reason why is just overuse. Right. So I tried to. Yep. That's it. So um, they'll have plenty of time to train the technical aspects. Um, so I'd like to develop physical. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then you mentioned about conditioning. So you're doing three times, three times a week, say off season. Does that include the strength training or is the strength training separate sessions on top of that? No, it's it's all integrated. So, okay. yeah. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. Strength and conditioning. Yep. So, so it'll be a, a completely separate session on its own. Str- the strength training followed by the conditioning Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Yep. In the mornings. So, um, it's a sacrifice, but it's the best time that it will work for everybody's schedule. So, um, everybody rolls in. We do some out fast release. We do some stretching, foam roll, PVC pipe warm up, walk in warm up, dynamic warm up. Um, this might be a point that we might argue about. How do you feel about speed ladders? I hate them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I implemented speed ladders, um, and I know a lot of people do. <laughs> not for not for speed though, but for like coordination, for balance, for proprioception, and also for like rhythm. Right? Obviously, coordination, but for like rhythm, teach them different rhythms. Right? Because I feel like. In the cage fight, there might be a flow of things. And if you can find like a rhythm, it's like, okay. Um, so we did a bit of that. And then we did a quick warm up on the bikes and then get right into the lift. Um, so we did like a movement type circuit, squats, base pulls or inverted rows, push ups, rotations, go through three rounds is what we started off with, ended up at five rounds and then get into your your lift so yeah that's that's how we kind of structured it then you condition afterward gotcha <laughs> before i jump into, into the latter debate the i'm assuming they, they started they they maybe sparred on friday how did you balance the strength conditioning on that day if they had sparring on say friday night or even saturday morning yeah so fried so essentially the way i did it is we would do lower body mondays upper body wednesdays total body on Fridays, but that total body would be like a trap bar deadlift day. So really, really not putting a ton on the hands, the wrists, the knees, you know, so we would do trap bar deadlift. And even um, from there, we could do it off of blocks if we really just wanted to get that concentric yeah. action. So yeah, that, that day was, um, yeah, the total body day. And that's also the day where we did that aerobic steady state conditioning. So that was just in preparation. That's another thing, too. I don't know who will end up listening to this, but just trying to stay proactive. Like literally sit down with the coach. Like I wasn't I hadn't been trained at the gym. Right. I hadn't really had that background. So we took time out every week when grabbed a coffee like, hey, Coach Rich. So tell me about what you envisualize, you know, as a coach. Whenever you're six weeks out, eight weeks out, two weeks out, two months out, like what's the plan coming up? Like how many fights are we fighting? Um, like in six months and 20 days or so, we had six fights. Um, so he was able to tell me that. I was able to stay proactive and then create the program that just makes sense for everybody. Because um, I'm not here. Like strength conditioning, again, it's just – it's a supplement to the sport. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Uh, I'll, dive, I'll dive a little bit more into that, but I'll, I'll come back to your latter one. And the reason 
I say I don't like them. I understand people use them for kind of general stuff and moving through, but even for the idea of rhythm and coordination and uh, I guess people also say sometimes for like fast feet and whatnot, the issue for me is all those things come down to the ability to decipher or solve the problem that's in front of them in the sport itself. So being able to anticipate being able to see what's coming through different visual cues what's happening in front of them and then being able to essentially solve the problem with whatever it is and for me ladders because you don't have any of that element for me there's just no transfer because you're just looking down at your feet moving your feet and that's where i see that closed skill of moving the feet versus open skill of having a whole environment around that's why i just don't see i just don't see the the value in the ladders themselves but you know, a thing is a lot of a lot of athletes and fighters love them, and yeah. you, you you put them out, and it's just like okay, I mean, go through it, sweet, <laughs> you know, whatever it's there. Yeah, just run through it, um, and it gives them something different. A lot of times, like how many speed ladders do you see in a combat gym? Yeah, how often do you see athletes mm-hmm. doing cone cone drills or coordination drills? Aside from you know something with gloves, mitts on, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, d- definitely. Uh, it definitely changes the pace if you're looking for something a little different there as well. But on that sparring day, so you mentioned it's like a trap bar, deadlift kind of day. What else goes on on that day then? Is it more of like a full body, almost like power power day then? Because the loads are typically lighter or less volume. Yes and no. Like off camp, it's super general. Like we're gonna do um, that trap bar deadlift, and we might add a plyo in there. Um, it might be some type of broad jump. Um, just like very, very general type plyo in there. Um, and then all we're working on is like lower body, posterior chain. Now, the closer we get though, um, we're going to work like some trap bar deadlift and we're going to maybe work in some resisted band broad jumps. Maybe we're going to do some multi response broad jumps. Um, so, so it, it progresses depending on the time and the year that we're in. Gotcha. So maybe go, go into that a little bit, like with the, with the resistance bands, you mentioned that earlier as well with the specificity, specificity stuff. Are you using more accommodating resistance or are you looking at uh, more, I guess, like for example, rotational stuff with the bands where you're able to, to get some generational speed on it? Both, both. Um, we hadn't done banded barbell work, but we'll just put a band on the athlete or we'll put a band on the rack, right? Take your hands out and just rotate. Boom, boom, boom. Because they're going through these ranges of motion, but wouldn't it be nice if you start to develop like actually develop those muscles off of the mat, right? Um, and then for like the broad jumps or the sprints, banded sprints in place um, for that, it's, it is like accommodating resistance, but we're not using barbells with it, if that makes sense. We actually, we actually have a question in the chat here. Oh. So uh, TP is asking, which books made the biggest impact on you? Which, uh, which advice would you give to a young student that wants to become a good s and c coach let's start with the books and then we'll move on to the next one so yeah, any books I, got, on you? I got a couple books with me um so this one the coaches strength training oh yeah the test system nice. yeah so if you just want to start off this is really easy to read really straightforward this is a good one there is a, a gentleman by the name of josh bryant he has a brand called jailhouse strong uh, his background is really like training bodybuilders, power lifters. Um, but he put out a book on like conditioning for MMA athletes or strength training for MMA athletes. And it's pretty, really straightforward. It's a good start. If you want to get into something heavier, I got it on my desk and I try to read a little bit each day. <laughs> you know, the, book that, the book that everyone says they've read but hasn't read. <laughs> <laughs> Holy grail. Like I got some sticky notes and I got like different. So, um, and then of course, I guess for me, like essentials of strength. For anyone who's, who's uh, listening, who's not watching, uh, it's uh super training, super that's training, that he held, that he held super up. training. Yeah. Um, it really depends on where you are, but you can't go wrong with the tier system. Can't go wrong with, if you really want just a reference for any question you might run into any issue you might have super training, the Holy grail, um, <laughs> essentials of strength conditioning. Um, I think that's a good one. So those are, those are like three. Other than that, I think it's, it's important to get out and get in the trenches. And yeah, once you have, once you have good understanding or if you have a mentor, 
go get some experience so you can see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. That that would be your advice to young, to young students who want to become a good SNC? Absolutely. Learn. Obviously, right, you need to, well, for, if you want to be accredited, right, if you want to be certified here in the States, at least like National Strength Condition Association is the larger, largest strength condition organization. Um, by 2030, you're going to have to graduate from an accredited program. So not to go off the rails, but you're going to need an education piece. But to add to that education piece, find a great mentor and go shadow, volunteer, go ask questions, go see athletes train in real life. Um, and then you'll start to develop your philosophy, your coaching style, the way you like to program. That would be, personally, that would be my advice. Hey guys, it's me again. I just want to let you know that I also have Sweet Science of Fighting rash guards and shorts, so you can represent Sweet Science of Fighting on the mats and within competition. We have the classic, just like the shirt I'm wearing, rash guard, Sweet Science of Fighting on the front, and we have the logos on the sleeves, and then X Marshall on the back. We also have that in a shorts variation, same thing, with the Sweet Science of Fighting writing on one leg, and we have the logo on the other, but my personal favorite, this is my personal favorite far. We have this in black and white. And it is the Tani Fag Protector Guardian version of the Sweet Science of Fighting logo on the back. This was designed by a Māori designer back in New Zealand. So a bit of my heritage on this jersey. It represents the acknowledgement of battle and war. It also represents strength and stability. And also has the New Zealand silver fern. But even if you're not a Kiwi, cop this this is an awesome design it is custom made design you will not find it anywhere else so check that that'll also be down in the description with a discount code but back to the podcast so richie had another another question from antonio baklava he's asking can you use similar concepts for skateboarding that's a good question antonio <laughs> i would imagine the speed ladder would be great for you <laughs> um, if you want some balance coordination, no, um, it might be a little bit different. It really depends on what level you're skateboarding and what the needs analysis looks like and what the demands are. You know, you'll probably need a good amount of total body strength. Um, you'll probably need a little bit of the ability to transfer some of that strength, I would imagine, right, to get that board up on the rail. I played Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Oh, I was okay. a kid, so that's the best yeah. PlayStation game I've ever made. <laughs> Tony Hawk's Pro Skater Two, man, that game best out of all of them. Best out yeah. of all of them as well. Uh, if you guys have any more questions and listening live, chuck them in the chat there, and I'll, I'll come back to them. Uh, I can't remember where we were now in, in our chat but, on on MMA. Yeah, but I know you um, asked about like explosive lifts. Maybe we yeah. will, um, and like the loads and the percentages. So the big thing. I guess another thing to add with this group, um, these are fly weights. These are bantam weights. Um, I think in the past, they had kind of been trained like a heavier weight uh, would be trained. So just a lot of strength building, a lot of slow, grinding, tough. And as a result, they had a ton of back pain. They had a ton of shoulder pain just because they don't have enough, enough mass on their body, enough functional mass to support those heavier loads and the amount of work they were doing. So um, I would always keep in mind just making the intensity relative to the athlete. Obviously, like their past medical history, their training age, training status, but their body comp. Um, for their explosive lifts, we work pretty, pretty light, and we just work variations. So we would do hang high pulls. We would do hang pulls. We would do hang jump shrugs. We might do a jerk. We might do a push jerk every now and again, but – um, not, I didn't program any cleans for them because I didn't want to go on the wrist. We probably would have been fine, but um, I was really just looking for the transfer and the explosiveness. That reminds me, the um, in rugby, so the Fijian rugby team, they're known for their athleticism, their speed, their their play of the ball, and the strength conditioning coach for them. So they were they had problems. I'm not gonna say problems. They had issue or not. They just had a thing where basically a lot of the Fijians would go play in, in France and Europe. And in France or and in Europe and rugby, they're very big on, like you mentioned, like heavy strength training often. And he found that, that you know, over time, the a lot of the players would, as you mentioned, would come up with stuff like that, or, you know, their the athleticism wasn't there like it was before. 
just because that was such a big emphasis. And I think that's a, a very similar thing, like what you're saying there, kind of rung a bell there <clears throat> around, you know, do the strength training, but you've got to actually do some some of the high velocity work as well to complement it. Otherwise you end up with problems like you mentioned, you know, structural issues, potentially becoming slower. That is a problem that can happen if your strength training isn't done properly. Right, yeah. Strong, slow, sore. Yeah, the three <laughs> S's, right? <laughs> like it's great yeah. you got strong, but we lost a lot of that that power, the ability to transfer that force in a timely manner. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have another question, actually. So same guy, TP, he's asking, would you say that explosiveness is like something you are born with or you can upgrade it to some extent? It's a good question. Um, um, well, technically, yes, right? So some individuals genetically, they're gifted. They're born with more type 2 fibers. And so we typically see that in sprinters, right? If you look at even their build, um, if you take a look at their legs, if you take a look at their calves, their Achilles tendons or their Achilles tendon, um, you can you can tell just genetically. So, yes, you can be. And that maybe we talk about it is like individualizing. So I did have to individualize a bit, even though I had a group um, where there's one athlete that he's just he's just a walking tendon. Like he just bounces when he walks. Right. He just boom. It's like, wow. Well, we need to build some strength because he was weak. But he was really powerful, which is great until you get locked into the cage with somebody that's around your same body comp, right? And they're hunting for your head, so you need something else. But um, then we have on the other side someone who just strong, very, very strong. Um, but when you ask them to produce force in less time, they have issues, right? Um, so, so for one it's developing strength and then but not taking away their natural gift for the other it's maintaining that strength and teach them how to transfer so do, do you find that your twitchier guys like that guy you mentioned are more susceptible to injury yes yeah somewhat and mainly just because that if that force occurs at such such a fast rate and maybe it's not even the force that's occurring. It's just their body's ability to stop that force. Uh, if there's not something in front of them, right? It's just like, boom. And they don't know if they haven't trained those systems. Um, I would say potentially, potentially, yeah. Nice. Uh, but you have an, another question from Antonio Backlover again. He's, he's asking, oh, wait, before I ask this one, are you familiar with ATG? Um, shit, what does it even stand for? The Knees Over Toes Group. What's ATG stand for? Uh, athletic training group, I think. Are you are familiar with that? I've heard of knees. I've never like really dove in. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's asking, what do you you guys think about ATG in terms of longevity? In terms of longevity for an MMA athlete. So, uh, do you want me to have a stab at that, and I'll have a stab at that after you, if there's a. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not well versed. I don't think I'm versed <laughs> enough really on yeah. the knees over toes, or if there's something specific. Or yeah, else I'll yeah, maybe throw something specific in the chat there, Antonio. But from my understanding, if I, it's they have a, a few assessments they like to use, mainly around shoulder function. There's some stuff around knees as well. Um, look, in terms of as a holistic approach, if that's the way you're going to train for MMA, I don't think it's good enough. Um, using some of the concepts potentially, if you have those issues, I know. Um, lots of people will give praise to some of the knees over toe stuff up in the knee pain, but there are a lot of people that get worse knee pain. So you need to understand kind of where that's coming from too. So just be aware of that. But if there's anything more specific, throw that in the chat too. Um, Cause yeah, we're not too, too familiar with that. I mean, remember a lot of the stuff around the knees over toes is actually just taken from Charles Poliquin way back in the day and then repackaged and marketed very, very well. <laughs> yep. The backwards, uh, the backwards sleep dragging, the in oh, shoulder yeah. internal rotation, yeah. the, uh, pol the split squat lunge with the knee goes forward. That's all. Pol it's all old Poliquin stuff back from the nineties. Is the nineties or two thousands, or maybe even eight, somewhere around there. But it's all just kind of come back to life and repackaged, and uh, repackaged very, very well, making some very good money. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. So if, if you are interested in the ATG stuff, definitely if you just check out some of old P Charles Poliquin articles okay. and stuff, you'll probably yeah. find a lot of the stuff in there as well, Antonio. Um, that could be interesting for you as well. Um, but you mentioned about, you're talking about the flyweights and bantamweights with their power training. So in terms of power training, how much are you doing, say, 
unloaded versus load versus loaded is loaded power training something that you're doing often or much of or are you spending a lot of your time doing things like unloaded plyometrics and jumps um off season is primarily unloaded to be honest with you that's my preference and again the best ability is availability like they're at an age number one like biologically chronologically and also in the sport to where what how much more can we improve their actual sport performance by just like loading them up right out the gate. So yeah, all season, a lot of body weight plyometrics, what we call gate swings or in and outs where you bring your feet in and out, drop into a squat, just light and tip like those are very, very easy. Um, and then we'll progress into more of like what I was telling you, more of like a push jerk, but with dumbbells. So you have an open end on that dumbbell and I restrict to the barbell. So like little things, like just watching them practice, watching them train, hopping in on some sessions, like, oh, okay, I can see where they, they'd they have some restrictions, but I can also see how these restrictions would be beneficial. Um, so we'll do, we'll progress to some of those dumbbells, still not very heavy. Uh, for them, maybe 20 pounds, 25 pounds, maybe 30 for some of the stronger ones. And then we progress to, yeah, um, some of those Olympic lift variations. Man, those dumbbell weightlifting very uh, derivatives are so underused. There's there's not many people that, that use them. I was breaking down a video, um, a boxer Arter. I can't even say his last name. Be- better of or better be of, and he was doing uh, dumbbell hang hang power clean and push press basically with it. And it at yeah for fighters so good as you mentioned because a lot of pressing a barbell overhead is pretty tough for a lot of fighters just because the postures they're in all the time. Right. So using the dumbbells just removes all of that and you can do it all. Right. That's it. Yeah. Just they can open <laughs> up and find their own pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. So for anyone listening, definitely give those a try. Uh, if, basically everything you can do with the barbell with a lot of those uh, Olympic weightlifting variations, you can do with dumbbells pretty much, pretty much exactly the same thing there. And yeah, same thing. I'm a big fan of the push press um, power jerks and things like that too, because it's full body uses your legs. You have to transfer from the floor through to your hands, just like throwing medicine balls as well. The, yeah, All those things link link really really well together but i think i think that's everything i had to to ask you quincy was anything else you wanted to add uh before we sign off um i don't know maybe for those listening (laughs) or future coaches just kind of of course like develop your philosophy but be flexible i think like the thing that really worked well for me not having a background in mma just the ability to connect build relationships um and obviously, yeah, just have being able to hold a conversation, be yourself, be your authentic self. If you don't 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 know something, you don't have to bluff it. Just like, yeah, I'm not familiar. What, what do you mean when you say this? Oh, OK. Or what does this look like? Like what's a guillotine? What's a rear naked? OK, let me see. All right. So how long do you hold? How does it feel? Um, and then going from there, like asking the athletes, some of them will be like, coach, this is not what I need right now. Like I need something. I feel like I'm losing my power. Well, okay, so like vertical power, horizontal power, when you like where are you missing? Or I feel like my wind is off. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to, you know, be be adaptable, right? Change a little bit if you need to. Um, especially if your goal is to to have success. So yeah, other than that, that's it. Have fun while you're doing it. <laughs> nice. We actually have another question from TP here. It's actually quite a good one here. This will be an interesting one. So what do you think about Dr. Michael Yesis, his opinion that athletes shouldn't squat deep, just half and quarter squats because there's no sport that requires a deep squat? Um, I respect Dr. Michael Yesis. Yep. Um, I think we I all think, do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to throw that out there first and foremost. Um, I think that there may be if we look through a different lens, right, there may be certain times where it might be more beneficial to squat with a restricted range of motion, right? Um, but I would say that the ability to – the your ability for your joints to achieve full ranges of motion, um, that's like Tudor Bampa. That's like high on his list, right? Um, yeah, flexibility, joint motion, joint range of motion. Um, we have to have – we have to have that and maintain that at all times. Now, if we're getting close to the season, we want to start transferring some of those forces, um, especially on a squat type motion where we might do a box squat um, for speed or speed squat. Certainly. So 
So I agree and disagree slightly. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you there. I mean, Dr. Yusuf, for anyone who's not familiar with this thing, he's us the, the guy who brought plyometrics to America from from Russia. And I haven't heard him. I don't know what interview that's from, but um, we're going to assume that he said this um, from TP here. But regardless, yeah, I think you, you still got it. Just because the sport doesn't involve uh, a certain movement doesn't mean you don't do those movements because some of those things are just general function. It's good to have that range of motion. Yes, you can do more half and quarter squats closer to a fight. If you want to get potentially better transfer, there's some good research with half and quarter squats transferring better to things like jumping and sprinting uh, compared to deep squats. So there's definitely something you can do there. We actually have one more question from TP. He says, last one he promises. <laughs> he says, how much of an impact does static stretching have for after training and are there any better solutions? Ooh. I like that one. I just did a video on that today. It went up. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, it really depends, I guess, on the athlete. Like for, I guess, younger athletes, I'll have them do some stuff. Like it's not something that 100% like I always recommend, uh, but it could help with the recovery process, right? It could help with restoring <clears throat> ranges of motion. It could help you, you know, with some of that soreness later on. So um, if you're looking for, a simple solution that's cost effective. Um, so if you don't have one of those Theraguns or if you don't have, you know, um, those compressions for your legs, stretch. You can stretch, stretch, stretch. Nice. And I will say, I'll let that, uh, TP, if you check out my latest breakdown video I just posted this morning, I actually did a whole breakdown of Gilbert Burns' new video actually touching on that. So that will have a bunch of information in there for you. But uh, a very quick synopsis. Yes, can potentially be beneficial uh, to go from, say, a parasympathetic or well, sympathetic to a parasympathetic response. So just going from like a fight or flight in training, then just kind of easing down to help facilitate the recovery. But in terms of improving, say, mobility and things, you get no real uh, structural changes in the muscle or tendon long term, which then becomes an issue of, you know, are you actually getting any benefit out of doing something like that? It's probably, after training, probably no harm most of the time. So you can do it. But in terms of benefits, uh, I don't think there's too many that you can add on top of that other than kind of just help facilitate the recovery process quicker. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, Quincy, I appreciate you coming on here. Where can people find and follow you and keep up with what you're doing? I know you've released some an MMA SNC video semi recently. Yeah, yeah. So YouTube, Quincy Johnson Fitness, and then Instagram, <clears throat> Quincy Johnson PhD, X, Quincy Johnson PhD. I'm on research gate. I have some research out there. I might do a case study with some of the fighters data and training approach that I have. Um, I figured that just to throw it out there, make it publicly available, accessible. Um, I think it'd be good to share. So yeah, that's where you can find me, whether it's YouTube or Instagram or X uh, research. Nice. Gate. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Yeah, do that case study and I'll break it down on the channel too. Okay. I'll do a, yeah. do a whole video on that. But yeah, that'd be perfect. I, I appreciate you coming on, Quincy, and uh, I'll catch you again. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me.